they are there. And we discuss the Greek words which could mean that they are, there's a period of time set by God. We don't know when this time is, but when it ha starts happening, it will happen quickly. And we found this from the book of Revelation, from the first chapter in Tachin, which means when something starts to happen, it will happen quickly. And we believe that the time is preparing us for this, but regardless when Jesus is coming, God is expecting us, is expecting to find us in a particular way. And the title of this passage, my title for this passage is, Don't Walk in Your Sleep. And I'm not referring to those who wake up in the night and they walk around, go to the fridge, you know, eat something or back to bed. I'm not referring to those. I'm referring to the spiritual part of it. Paul is not concerning about those who wake up at night and have no idea what they've done, but he's concerned about the Christians. And he is expecting that the Christians walk in the light. So the goal of this uh, passage, this chapter, we, we divided the book in chapters, but in this chapter we find that Paul wants to encourage the believers to live holy life in the midst of their pagan culture. And we also live in, a, in the midst of a pagan culture. Whether it's religious or morally, we are in the midst of this and God is also calling us through this letter that we should walk in the light. Uh, supporting scriptures of this we find, for example, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, where Paul is saying, walk in a manner worthy of the calling of the Lord. This is amazing. Paul is calling us, or better, the Holy Spirit is calling us to walk in a manner which is worthy, worthy for who? For me, for the church, for my denomination. No, it's worthy of the one that's doing the calling, and that's God himself. Amen. And therefore I need to ask myself, is my life worthy to the Lord? Do I give pleasure to God with my life? with the things I think, and with the things I say, and with the things I do, with my life. Do I give pleasure to God? Remember that we've been created for the pleasure and for the glory of God. Colossians chapter 2 verse 6 also says, Therefore, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in Him. You might remember when we explained para teoma, but at least the Greek word for but to walk, it's not like moving two legs to go somewhere. You move those two legs, but you are examining something. It is used, for example, when Jesus is walking among the church. He is walking and he is examining the church. We believe that where two or three are, are gathered in his name, Jesus is in the midst. Isn't that right? So when we are gathered here today, guess what? Guess who's present? Jesus. And I'm sure he's not on the attendance list. We have the attendance list of COVID and stuff. And I don't, we don't think we put Jesus was present. Well, we don't need to tell the government that, but we know. We know that Jesus is here and what is Jesus doing? He is examining us, among other things. Something else is doing, he's uniting us by his word. He is keeping us together. He is giving us hope in the times of no hope. We are here because Jesus has a plan for his church. And we are the church, as we have already had. Yes, we come and worship because that is what we do. It is not a task that we have to do. And that is why the Bible says, whether you eat or drink, do it for the glory of God. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, Jesus, I said, is in our midst to unite us together. The Bible says, we are one 
in his body. Isn't that wonderful? We are one in his body. Although we are different, we have different thoughts, we have different backgrounds, we come from different cultures, we have different languages, with all the different physical defects and other things, God wants us to be one. Hallelujah. And that's one of the tasks that the Holy Spirit has to do, but as I was saying to someone else, we need to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Jesus comes to unite, but also he comes to separate. Many times we don't think about these things. And the Bible speaks many times where we are to separate from anyone or anything that is leading us or trying to lead us into the wrong way. So, although Jesus unites the body, he also separates believers from unbelievers. When we go to heaven, there is not going to be believers and unbelievers. There is not going to be faithful servants and unfaithful servants. Only the faithful ones will make it into the heavens. So this is the kind of separation that the, the, the Bible is speaking about. Jesus separates light from darkness. He separates day from night. He separates those who are sleeping from those who are awake. He separates those who are sober from those who are drunk. And these are things that we find in this chapter which we need to um, contemplate about. We can talk to them about them till the kingdom comes. But they won't do anything good to us unless we start hearing and we start obeying. In other words, we need to change. Some people might think that they've changed enough. And, that, and, and truthfully, there were people that told me, I've changed enough. You can never change enough. Because you are a sinner, and you will remain a sinner. The difference is that you will be a sinner, but saved by the grace of God. But anyone and every person that recognizing that grace of God, then will feel obligated towards God to live for His glory and for His praise. The passage, starting from chapter 4, speaks about the rapture. The Thessalonians, remember, were people, were uh, young Christians. They have not one book of the Bible like we have. Probably the first Thessalonians was the first letter uh, that was written from the New Testament. And they were persecuted big time. They were persecuted because they have become a small group which goes against the bacon culture. So you have a country, a, a city called Thessalonia, or Thessalonica, and suddenly you have these missionaries going there and save people, and these people start living a different lifestyle, which is totally contrary to the culture. So they were being persecuted, and through that persecution, they were worried and were thinking, because some of them died, is Jesus coming back? And Paul is writing uh, chapter 4, the second half, and this, cha this chapter, to give hope to the struggling church that Jesus is coming back. And this hope is also important for us. We need to live as if Jesus coming today, not tomorrow. But when the temple is being built, you see, we do not know when Jesus is coming. He's coming like a thief in the night. Although we have clues, and we spoke about some of those clues last Tuesday, we do not know the exact second, the exact minute, or the exact day, or month, or year that Jesus is coming. We know that there is a time and a season. We know that there is a day of the Lord. We know that he comes like a thief in the night. And therefore, we must be ready. 
Last Tuesday when we spoke about the subject and we were going to the churches of uh, Revelations and we saw that every church seemed to represent part of the church age. Time passed and it was over time and we closed the service very quickly and I kind of missed saying the last little bit which is because maybe a few seconds. After chapter 3, then we have chapter 4. And it starts from verse 1. And there we read, after these things, meta to day, after these things, which things? The things that John was just writing about, which are found in chapter 3. Chapter 2 and chapter 3. And that is the church time. It's the church season. It will pass. And after the church season passes, these things, which then we we'll read from chapter 4 up to chapter 19, will start happening. And brothers and sisters, I don't think you and I would like to be living in those days. Therefore, as believers, we must hold on to the promise of the second coming of the Lord. Now, today, more than ever, especially in our country, which kind of is still uh, hard to believe, that people don't believe in God, they don't believe in heaven, they don't believe in hell, they don't believe in... Um, Anything which our grandparents taught us and our parents taught us, you know, those values that we used to cherish. I, I was surprised to see somebody pointed out yesterday after prayers about, you know, this great swimmer that swam from, I don't know, 50 miles or whatever, I don't know how long did it is with this swim. He was praying to this pagan goddess, and when I was reading, his experience, he was seeing these strange things in the sea. He said he had an experience with this Brazilian female deity. His experience was with demons, with nothing else. And people are believing more of this, of this stuff today, this, this new age stuff, rather than the believing, believing what the Bible is teaching. So when you really talk about the coming of the Lord, people laugh at you today. And many Christians, I know at least of at least two, which doubt, which doubt if Jesus is truly coming. Their, their complaint was, their, 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 their thesis was, the church has been waiting 2,000 years and nothing happened. Well, as Sandra pointed out a couple of weeks ago, I don't know how long it was, God has no time. We have, we have a chronos, but God has no chronos. God doesn't have a watch, He doesn't have a calendar. For Him, one day is like 1,000 years and doesn't make any difference. We have. But we better make sure that the time we have here, we are living it for the glory of God. Waiting for His second coming. People should wait for the second coming. In fact, we are, are urged twice in the scripture to pray for the second coming. The Bible ends up with this prayer, come, Lord Jesus, come. Hallelujah. So it's something we expect. But if we believe that Jesus is coming, then there must be a change of lifestyle. And I have to say, that although we preach holiness and we preach sanctification and we preach about the second coming, coming of the Lord. Some people still live as they've been living before we started Romans one and a half years ago. And the Romans that didn't change them, I don't know why. And we must take these things seriously. If Jesus is coming, he's coming for the faithful ones. And you have to ask ourselves, we have to ask ourselves, am I a faithful believer? Or am I a half-baked Christian? There will be no half-baked Christians in heaven. They will always be faithful, not perfect, faithful. After Jesus comes, we will become perfect because we see him as he is. But we must be faithful, faithful to Jesus, to who he is and what he has trusted to us to do 
for his kingdom. So what is the promise of God? What is the promise of his coming? Even Peter, Second Peter, verse uh, chapter uh, between chapter three and four, he refers about the second coming, and people, the scoffers, will say, "What is this promise of his coming?" If Jesus said he will return, he will return. But we're not talking just what we read out of a book. We are reading. The Bible for us is more than a book, but when we read what the Bible is saying will be indicative for his second coming, then we have no doubt. And that is why many preachers today, and they've been doing this for some years, what's happening today in the political world are all signs of the coming of the Lord. What is happening in the moral cultures and the moral values of many cultures, especially like ours, they are indicative that the second coming of the Lord. Why? Because it will be a time of godlessness. It's a time where there, God is just a culture. God is not important in our life. And you know why? Because it started from the 17th century. Man wanted to make himself God. And that's why placing science and things like that and make that authority instead of the Holy Scripture. When we dethrone God from our heart and make ourselves God, we'll go back to the Garden of Eden, that wonderful promise, that simple promise of Satan to Adam and Eve. You don't want to eat of that fruit? You know why God doesn't want you to eat of that? Because if you eat, you become gods. And from that day onward, people wanted to become gods. Satan wanted to take the throne of God and sit instead of God. So it is his nature. Remember, even Paul teaches us that the God of this world is Satan. So whatever he is planning, whatever he is doing, it is not according to Yahweh, the creator of the heavens and of the earth. We must live expectantly, expecting Jesus to come. Let us be ready to meet our Lord. Some Christians will look forward for that coming because they know they will receive the crowns that we spoke about in previous sermons. But some Christians will be ashamed when Jesus returns. Even John mentions this, First John chapter 2, verse 28. It says, and now little children, abide in him. Where do you abide? In him. That word abide is a very short uh, Greek word, meno, which means where you have your permanent address. Did you remember that? I said that to you many times, or a few times. I don't know how I said it. Eh? Where is your permanent address? Is it in Christ or in the world? And that's what, one question we need to ask ourselves, to examine ourselves in our Christian walk. And now that your children abide in Him, that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him and his coming. So we have people that can be courage, full of confidence, but then also you have people that will be ashamed. Do you remember when we spoke about the crowns? And we were talking about um, those who will not receive their crown and how they would feel. Do you remember that, that, that discussion? Well, we had that discussion in one of the Bible studies. And apparently in heaven, you can be ashamed. And I'm not saying this is a doctrine, but I, and I don't know how it feels, but certainly I don't want to be ashamed when Jesus returns. I want to be one of those who are full of confidence, not pride, not that I can say I have made it. It's not like that. In confidence because God knows my heart. 
God knows my integrity. God knows that I confess my weaknesses. God knows that I confess my sins. God knows that I want to change the things that I cannot change. 